It's good to see everyone with us here today. As always, we come together on the first day of the week to worship our Heavenly Father. And it's the thing that keeps us going from week to week, day to day, in our service unto Him. And it's always our prayer and our petition that what we offer up to Him in worship, that He finds acceptable in His sight. If you would this morning, go ahead and take a moment. And let's be turning in our Bibles to Proverbs 28, verse 1. We'll come back to that here in a minute, but our first verse we'll look at this morning in the course of the lesson is found in Proverbs chapter 28, there in verse 1. One of the things that I've often found encouraging of studying the Bible, the Old Testament especially, are the variety of Bible characters, if you would, that we see throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Some of them are well known for their courage and their faith. Some of them are well known for their lack of faithfulness unto God. When we study the Old Testament scriptures, we learn both lessons. We learn lessons of faithfulness and lessons of unrighteousness. We see lessons of courage and lessons of fear. And oftentimes when we think about it, we should be using this to help us have the necessary courage that we have to have in order to serve our Heavenly Father. Now, we might think in the nation that we live in today that it doesn't take a whole lot of courage to be a Christian. But I would suggest to you that it does. That oftentimes it's not the challenges of the government that we face that some have faced in the past. But it's the challenges of friends and families and um, neighbors and just everyday people that we meet. And this is not to paint the picture that everyday people that we meet is a threat to us. I'm not trying to say that at all. But many times when you think about what James chapter 1 talks about, the way that sin comes into our lives, it oftentimes will come into our lives from a way, a direction that we really aren't expecting it. And we've said this before, sometimes our own worst, that we are our own worst enemy. You know, Peter talks about the devil going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But how many times in reality are we that devil if you would? Because we willingly walk into temptation. We willingly allow ourselves to get into situations that will tempt us. You know, and with that being the case, we have to learn that maybe the hardest person we have to stand up to is ourselves at times. And so this morning I want to talk to you about the idea of having courage. And we'll show from the scriptures why Christians should have courage. But let's start with some great Bible examples of individuals in the Old Testament that had great courage before God. Consider if you would right off the bat, Abraham. God called Abraham to go to a country where he would show him. And so Abraham did. He left the Ur of Chaldees. He went up to Haran. God called him out of Haran down to the land of Canaan. Left everybody behind except his immediate family and Lot. And he went down into the land of Canaan. Served God faithfully. You know, and when you think about Abraham, did Abraham have his problems? Did he have his moments of weakness? Well, sure. We see that in the case of the point with the dealing with uh, Abimelech, I believe it was, king of Egypt at the time, and his infatuation with Abraham's wife, Sarah. But Abraham still is known for a man of courage. Moses as well, same thing. God called Moses to leave the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Did Moses have faith in God? Absolutely. Was Moses courageous? Well, yes, once he finally fully believed that God was on his side. And he saw the signs that God would do. And ultimately, it wasn't the prowess of Moses that scared the Egyptians into letting the people go. It was the power of God. You know, did Moses have his faults? Well, sure. All the way end up when they went and God told Moses in the last case to go speak to the rock. Moses said, look here, you rebels, what we must do. And he struck the rock. And so because he did not glorify God, he was not allowed to enter into the land of Canaan, but he was still a man of courage. What about Deborah? Was she a lady of courage? Yeah. Look at Deborah, one of the judges there of Israel. Very courageous before God. Gideon. Gideon was very courageous. Listened to all the instructions that God gave him and took an army of 300 against an army of thousands. And God gave him victory. King David, 
I mean, as a young man, he was able to kill a lion and a bear. And by the way, a giant nine-foot man that caused everybody else in the Israelite army to cower and to shake. Again, was David a perfect man? Of course not. David had his faults, but he was still a man of courage. King Jehoshaphat is another king that we could talk about who courageously led the children of Israel in a direction that would be more righteous before the Heavenly Father. Throw uh, um, Hezekiah in there as well if you wanted to. And many, many others. The apostles, great examples. Faithful Christians seen within the first century. The point is... When we look at all of these individuals, we ask ourselves, did they ever have fear? Well, sure, they had fear. Remember Peter? Three times, do you know who this man is? He says, I don't know who that man is. Never seen him before in my life. Finally, he cursed and swore the last time. But they still were known as people of courage because they were. And so this gives you and I a great deal of hope to know that if these individuals that we look at in the past can have courage before God and despite their faults, still faithfully serve the Lord, that we too can do the same. But it requires us to study the scriptures. It's not enough to simply say, oh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We've got to have the knowledge that comes from his word. And this is what strengthens us. This is what tells us, you know, how we are to be strong. And to be able to understand that when the Bible tells us to be meek, it also tells us to be strong. When the Bible tells us to be gentle, it also tells us to be courageous. And Bible study helps us to kind of understand all that together. But in this lesson, we're going to first focus on two things that brings courage into our lives. And then we'll show what this courage allows us to do. The first thing I want you to know, and, and this, this goes right along with the, the song about trusting in Jesus that Arthel led a while ago, is that we have courage that comes from trusting our Heavenly Father, trusting in Him. Notice in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, Solomon writes the following. It's a very simple statement, but one I think is a good one to start off with. He says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as lions. Powerful statement there. The wicked run away when no one's chasing them. But the righteous, they are as bold as lions. The idea of boldness here is to trust, to trust in, to have confidence in, to be bold, to be secure. And we're not talking, we're not talking about a confidence within ourselves. We're talking about a confidence in God. And that's where it's really important. Everything we're talking about here with courage is not within our own abilities, something we can brag about. No, it's about our trust in God. And when we trust in God, when we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, when we trust in the word that's been given to us by the Holy Spirit, then it enables us to properly serve him. It's all about submitting unto him. It's all about having a reverence and respect, a, a fear even if you would. Not the fear where we quake in our shoes, but a reverence and a respect for him. This is what guides our lives and allows us to move when the Lord tells us to move, to preach when the Lord tells us to preach, if you would. Think back to the apostles. They said, we cannot but help to preach the gospel of Christ. Because this is what God had told them to do. But in Proverbs chapter 14, notice here in verses 26 and 27. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. When we understand our relationship with the Heavenly Father and who he is and what he has done then it puts us into a peace, uh, uh, not a peace, but a, a place of submission and heart that turns into trust and confidence and courage in him. If we don't have the respect for God, we're not going to have courage that comes from God. If we don't have the, the fear that he talks about here, we're not going to see the need to trust in him. But with this, we do. Turn with me now over to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. Hebrews chapter 13. Notice with me here for just a moment the Hebrew writer. Beginning there in Hebrews chapter 13, and let's start there in verse 5. Let your conduct, he says, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. 
For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That comes from trust. That comes from a heart that trusts our Heavenly Father. Because of what he has done for us, because he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, we can with boldness say, he is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And this, this is what enables Christians to have a courage to be able to stand up in our service unto our Heavenly Father. But the second thing that we find that courage comes from is faith. Now, faith can be often talked about in different ways depending on the context. Faith can mean a trust where you trust in God. Faith, depending on the context, can mean a persuasion, a conviction. And oftentimes when you think about faith that is required to become a child of God, it is that persuasion and conviction that he is the word of God. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, he says, repent therefore and be converted. The idea of the heart must be converted to submit unto the will of God. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 36, when Peter told them, this man whom you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior. They heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted within the heart that what they had done was wrong. And it caused them to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that day, 3,000 souls did that. Because they believed they were convicted by the message that was presented, and they trusted that message to be from God, and they trusted God to forgive them of their sins. So when we talk about faith, Courage coming from faith. We think about what 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13 has to say. Turn over there for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And note with me here in verse 13. The Apostle Paul in the closing portion of his uh, first letter that we have here to the brethren in Corinth. He says quite simply. This is the New King James translation. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be, be brave, be strong. I think the King James Version says, quit you like men. Be brave, be strong. The idea there is to act like a man. Now, can women be brave? Obviously. <laughs> and more the idea there is the expression that we all need to man up, if you would. We need to watch. We need to stand fast in the faith. We need to be brave and be strong. That's what Paul says. And it is so crucial if we're going to live a life faithful unto our Heavenly Father, if we're going to live our life in such a way that enables us to overcome sin, we have to be willing to take a stand. We have to be willing to be brave and to be strong and not to allow ourselves to, be, to become cowardly in the face of the dangers that we might face in the world. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3 now, verses 10 through 12. Notice what the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus writes. Ephesians chapter 3 beginning there in verse 10. He writes there, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, Ephesians 3 verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So here we come back to the idea of faith again. In him we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Your, if you would, your Christianity is meaningless if you don't trust God. All right, it's not simply some religion that you can choose from. We've got a hundred of them in the world today. We have a thousand in the world today. You pick your flavor. It doesn't work that way. What Jesus Christ established when he died upon the cross of Calvary, that body of Christ, that church over which he is the head, you can only be a part of that with the faith to follow the word of God. And it is this faith that will then make you have boldness. It will give you 
confidence. And as he says, boldness and access with confidence. So here we have it. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? The idea that faith comes by us trusting in God. Faith comes by us having faith in God, which are kind of synonymous. But we also find that faith comes, or courage, comes from Jesus Christ. Well, in what way? How does faith come from Jesus? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. This takes us back to, I believe, where we began for our scripture reading in Hebrews chapter 4. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at verses 15 through 16 one more time. Here the Hebrew writer. Beginning in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's start there in verse 15. He writes the following. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But was at all points tempted as we are yet without sin. The text says. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help at the time of need. Did you see there what enables us to come boldly before the throne of grace? What enables us to have this courage to serve our Heavenly Father and to turn to Him? Well, he says, first off in verse 14, see, how, see that we have a great high priest. And then he identifies him as Jesus, the Son of God. And then verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That is, Jesus Christ was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. And as a result of that, we know that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. There was a great divide that was enacted, if you would, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. That sin separated them from God. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5, 12 through, 13, or 12 through 19, that by one man sin entered the world and death through sin. And this death spread to all men because all sin. There was a great divide between man and God. And it took, it took the perfect sacrifice to make the fellowship between man and God once more possible. And that was the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And it is this fellowship that we're talking about that enables us to boldly come before the throne of grace. But we'll also see the Hebrew writer reminds us about the boldness to enter the holiest. Look over in Hebrews chapter 10. Oftentimes the Hebrew writers will use, the Hebrew writer here, writer of Hebrews, will use what we would call types and anti-types, um, shadows and the real. And the Hebrew writer really helps us to understand that much of the tabernacle, much of the tabernacle that, that God had instructed the Israelites to build, served as a foreshadow of something better to come. All right, and so the Hebrew writer helps us understand different elements of that so that we can better understand what we have now with Jesus Christ. Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning there in verse 19, let's read down through verse 23. He says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Notice that he who promised is faithful. Under the law of Moses, they were told what to do when they committed trespasses. And they were told that if they committed, if they offered the trespass offering, that their trespass would be forgiven them. But, and it was, it was because Christ would die on the cross of Calvary. But now we have, under the new covenant of Christ, we have a much greater spiritual relationship with God. Now understand, the law of Moses required spiritual uh, worship of our Heavenly Father. God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said that to the people under the Old Testament law of Moses there. But, the law, but God's people under the law of Moses was a physical nation, not spiritual. Okay? And that as a result, they would fall and they would sin against God. He would punish them and they would repent and they would bring them back. But finding fault with them, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, they did not honor his covenant. 
He then fulfilled what Joel prophesied in Joel 31, beginning of verse 31, where he would establish with them a new covenant. And this new covenant, the Hebrew writers explain, is what enacted when Christ died upon the cross of Calvary. Now, what's my point? My point is this. We now are a spiritual nation, not a physical nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are his own special people now. And so as a result, our, our relationship, if you would, with God is now so much better than they had it because now we are truly able to walk in fellowship with God. Now back to this statement here we saw in the text. Look at it again, back up in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, does this mean that we are perfect? Absolutely. Well, we're supposed to be. Not perfect in behavior and action, but our sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And what has separated us from God has now been removed, and now we can grow and grow in grace and grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We can have this courage to stand fast in the word of the Lord and not to waver and not to fail. One more point here. Courage comes from Jesus because abiding in the Lord gives us great confidence. Turn with me to 1 John 2. One of the things that I've noticed in the study, and, and you've noticed it too, we've talked about a lot. When you study 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John uses terminology a lot that talks about us abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in us. Us abiding in God, God abiding with us. The words of Christ abiding within us and us abiding in Christ. And even us abiding in the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God abiding, abiding in us. But this past week, I was looking, I was trying to work up the lesson for John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, Jesus talks about the very same thing with him abiding in the Father and the Father abiding in him. And I can't help but think that John had a wonderful understanding of the true idea of fellowship. That when Jesus was on this earth, he said, if you see me, you see my father. There are three questions, actually two questions and one request. And the request was in that text, show us the father. And Jesus says, you see me, you see the father. And the same thing here. We abide within the Lord, the Lord abides within us. And this knowledge should give us great confidence. Here we go, 1 John chapter 2. Let's start reading there in verse 28. 1 John 2, beginning there in verse 28. Here's what he says. And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Did you notice what he said? Abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed. Look over in chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. He says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The concept here that we're looking at is this. When we stand before the throne of God, it's not that he gives us great arrogance to say, okay, let me in. I was faithful to you all my life. It's my turn now. Give me my reward. No. It's when we stand before the throne of God, we'll know his love towards us. We'll know his promises. We'll know that he has forgiven us of all of our past sins. And when we did sin and we turned back and asked him to forgive us, he forgave us. We know that we walked in fellowship with him until the day that we died. And so based on his promises, based on the fact that we are his children through the spirit of adoption, then we have confidence. Not of ourselves. Not because we've earned it, not because we've deserved it, because we have not and we do not. But it's this courage that comes because of the price that Jesus Christ paid when he died upon the cross of Calvary. So what does that leave us with here at the, begin, at the end? Well, you know, a lesson like this cannot be presented without going to Ephesians chapter 6. Because this is really what it is all leading up to. 
How do we live our lives on this earth, waiting for the day the Lord to come again? Waiting for that day that he comes again. How do we live our lives? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, let's start reading in verse 10. Let's read down through verse 16 or verse 13, although there's a lot more there we could look at. Ephesians 6 verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that we may be able to stand, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Did you notice that he tells us our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against those who would want us to walk away from our heavenly father and every time we take a stand every time we withstand that which is evil every time we stand for the word of god we're exercising the courage that we have and that comes from trusting in him from having faith in him and from jesus christ our lord and savior now here's a question for you this morning if you're not yet a Christian, if you've not yet answered the gospel's call into salvation, question is, why not? You say, well, I don't know enough about Jesus Christ to really do that. Well, let us study with you. I'm not really convinced that there is sin within my life and I have to worry about it. Well, let us study with you. Let us sit down and help show you God's plan for man in the great scheme of redemption and ultimately his plan for you that you might be saved. If you believe that Christ is a son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins, then you can be buried with Christ in baptism to rise up then to walk in the newness of life. It's what Peter told the folks on the day of Pentecost and is what Jesus told his apostles to preach in Mark 16 verses 15 and 16. You rise out of the water grave of baptism, not because there's something special about the water, because there's not. It's an answer of a good conscience towards God, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 21. You rise up then to walk in the newness of life. If you've not yet made that decision, we call upon you this morning to do that, to be, obey the gospel's call into salvation. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Where's your courage? What have you lost it to? It's time to identify that you, you know what the problems, is, the problems are in your life. Just like I would know the problems in my life. You know, it's not like your car. Your car starts acting up and you got to take it to somebody and figure out what's wrong with it. You know the problem. And so if there's a problem and if it has led you away from God, then it's time for you to repent and turn back to him today. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, now's the time to come forward as we stand and as we sing.